Natasha said, my name is Molly Peoples. I'm an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the circumgalactic medium, which is just a fancy way of saying the stuff around galaxies, and I'll, I'll get into this more later in the talk. Um, but Natasha, when she invited me to give this talk, wanted me to tell you a little bit about how I became a scientist and what my path has been. I'm very lucky in that I can tell you this story using only the map of the lower 48 in the United States. A lot of scientists, in order to eventually settle down, have to, at some point, live abroad. Um, I was born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina, and I like to say that, like all kids, I've always been a scientist, um, in the sense that all kids are scientists, and they do repeated experiments along the lines of, you poke it, you try to figure out what happens, and then you do more repeated experiments just to, to make sure that your original uh, data are true. I got into more formalized, structured um, science by doing science fairs and research projects in high school. This is the old school technology that, that I was playing about earlier. Um, uh, this is a picture of my senior year of high school, and I was lucky enough to attend, as Natasha said, the RSI program, um, which really kind of opened my, my world into what the available potential research programs were. I then uh, went, at which went, at the time, was very far away to super cold Massachusetts to MIT for college, uh, where I majored in physics, um, and I'm happy to tell you in the networking session about how much fun it was going from, you know, a regular public school education in South Carolina to an MIT physics degree. Um, but it worked out because I was able to solidify my desire of doing science research as a career, and specifically physics and astronomy. Um, and I wound up going to Ohio State and then getting a PhD in five years in astronomy. And um, yes, Ohio State is a very different kind of school to attend than, than MIT. Um, so in a lot of fields, you typically go straight from getting your PhD, getting your doctorate, to going straight to a, a faculty type position. But in astronomy, that's basically not the route at all. You typically do uh, one or two uh, what are called postdoc positions. Uh, so then I spent three years in Los Angeles at UCLA um, as a postdoctoral researcher. And being a postdoc is pretty much fantastic. Uh, your only job is just to do research. It's amazing. Except you have no job security whatsoever. So about two years after arriving in LA, I was already writing up job applications to figure out what I was doing next. Uh, really puts a damper on the whole enjoyment of the job thing. Um, and then I wound up here in uh, Baltimore at Space Telescope Science Institute, where I was a postdoc for a year. Um, and then I was lucky enough to join the staff at Space Telescope um, as a, on the tenure track. So most people, when I tell them I'm in Baltimore, and they you know what do you do, where do you work, I'm at Space Telescope Science Institute, their eyes glaze over, they have no idea what I'm talking about. I say, well, we do the science operations for the Hubble Space Telescope. And they're like, oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, I've heard that one. Um, well, actually, Space Telescope is involved with a lot of different space missions. That's the other little misconception I've learned is, well, it's a telescope, of course it's, you know, looking at space. Well, actually, all of our telescopes are physically in space. Um, so, in addition to Hubble, which we just celebrated the 25th anniversary of, which is terrifying when you start thinking of ages of, like, undergraduates right now, um, we're also uh, the home of all the data for Kepler. Um, this is the... Um, telescope that's been finding lots and lots and lots of planets recently. Future home for data for TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's going to find even more planets. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a ginormous, um, the uh, uh, 6.4 meter um, infrared space telescope that's going to be launched in a scant three years. You're definitely going to be hearing about that a lot of the news. We are both the science home for that. And they're in the middle of clearing out half of one of the floors of our building to build the flight operations and mission control for that, for that survey. And we're looking more towards the future. What's after James Webb? Uh, what are we going to be launching the 2020s and the, the 2030s? So my position is I'm a tenure-track astronomer. This is basically completely the same as we can make it to being a tenure-track faculty member at a university, except because we don't have students, we don't teach classes, 50% um, of my time is still spent doing research, but the other 50% of my time is what we call functional work. And it's basically supporting these different missions. So uh, the bulk of my functional work is on two of the, working on two of the spectrographs. So one is COS, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. These are both on Hubble, by the way. Um, and COS is a UV spectrograph.
spectrograph that was installed um, in 2009 um, in the last servicing mission to Hubble. It's amazing. Um, and the second instrument that I work on is STIS, the Space Telescope Im Imaging Spectrograph. I'm not going to be talking about this later in the talk, uh, but it's got quite a varied history. It was installed in 1997. Um, it failed in 2004, took a nap, and the astronauts were able to fix it in uh, 2009. And it's working beautifully, and it's working so beautifully that pretty much the calibrations are stable, and it can just keep on going, and we spend all of our time taking care of costs. Um, and I spent a little bit of my functional time working on W first, which is the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope. It's also a really hilarious pun because the main point of this telescope is to um, uh, study dark energy, and the big dark energy is called parameter of state uh, that this uh, telescope is looking to measure. The variable that's used for that is W, so it's the W first. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's also going to be looking at exoplanets. It's basically the same size as Hubble, uh, but the amount of sky that it can see at the same, at, 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 in a single shot, uh, the field of view, is about 100 times bigger than Hubble. So it's, it's going to be phenomenal. Um, it's set to launch early 2020s. We're really hoping to get some overlap with it with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and so we're currently in what's called the pre-formulation phase. We're trying to figure out exactly what the si potential science capabilities of this are. Um, I'm just going to throw out these potential resources and mention, um, I've seen a lot of you have gotten these uh, handouts I have over here. Um, a big part of a uh, space telescope, you can't really see it here, is we have uh, missions uh, or operations, which is taking care of these instruments and supporting the science output of the community. We have archives, which is here are all the data I have at it, it's going to be great. But there is a large education and public outreach component. I'll be putting these up again at it later, later in the talk. The other thing that I forgot to put up here is we have um, a lot of public talks. There's, in, in particular, once a month on Tuesdays, uh, there's a public talk that's fantastic, and you, your students, your family, send everybody to it. Pretty good. They're also um, archived online, um, and all the talks given at Space Telescope, either for the public or for scientists, are on our webcast online. And I'll add that link before these get posted. So, for my research, what I study is galaxies. Um, I study galaxy evolution, um, and we use that word in a very different way than the biologists use it. We use it just to mean how does it change through time? Not how do certain galaxies change into other galaxies, but how does an individual galaxy or a population of galaxies grow through time? Sort of like the evolution of a human being from a baby to a senior citizen. Um, just to give you a, a quick uh, orientation for how to look at galaxy pictures, uh, so this is spiral galaxy, sort of like we'd see in our Milky Way, and I've got a, a lithograph over there of this one. So when you see yellow in these pictures, those are generally older stars, like the sun, <coughs> and it's yellow. The blue you see out here is much younger stars. So one of the things that pops out at you when you look at pictures of galaxies is the older stars tend to be in the middle, and those younger stars tend to be on the outside. Um, you can sort of see it on the screen, but the bright red regions, and I'll be coming back to this later, are the regions where stars are currently forming today. And they're bright red because they're ionizing the gas around them. So that red there is actually the H-alpha emission line. Um, so ionized hydrogen that, that's um, uh, been ionized from all these star, stars forming. And so a lot of what I do, oh, so, you know, there's also, this is a, an Edgeon galaxy. Um, you can see this bright, uh, this thick amount of dust um, in, in galaxies. So galaxies basically connect collections of stars, gas, and dust. And when I say dust, um, this is one of the weird things astronomers do. We use really normal words that sound like you know what they mean, and then you learn that they actually have some super technical definition. Um, in this case, dust it can be anything from complex molecules uh, to basically uh, soot. So polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, or PAS. Um, and they're very, very small amount of the material in galaxies by mass, but they do wild things to the light, such as absorb it. Um, so you've got billions of stars over there, you can't even see it because there's so much dust between us and it. So what I do is I try to understand how do different galaxies have different properties? Why do these all look so different? These two are, are colliding, you have a bunch of stars and dust forming. This is a super, super tiny galaxy that hasn't formed many stars at all. Um, you can just kind of by eye point to every star in that galaxy. Um, this is a galaxy that's falling into a, a, a group of other galaxies and the gas is being stripped off of it. Some galaxies look like penguins. Galaxies that um, are in giant groups 
they, these are all yellow, right? So all of the stars in here are old. There are no stars currently being formed in this group of galaxies, and that's a typical thing that you see. Why is that? That's one of the things that I try to figure out. Um, galaxies that are colliding have you know, big tails, yes, basically trying to figure out why, why are these all so different. Um, and as it turns out, that a lot of the answer is, so the star is the part of the galaxy that's really easy to see. Um, but a lot of the answer to what's going on with these galaxies is having to do with what's going on outside of the galaxies in the much more difficult to observe regions. Um, I just love this painting. This is uh, from a mural in a hallway at MIT, and it's reminded me of two things. So the first one is, when I think of science uh, or research as a profession compared to when I was taking classes. So, uh, secret, I hated taking classes. I basically like checked out of dealing with classes my sophomore, junior year of high school, and I was just like done with that. Um, and so I was that kid you really didn't want to have in your classroom because I just didn't do anything. Um, and a big part of when you're when you're given a, a problem in a classroom, um, uh, you know, on a quiz or a problem set, you've already been or even in a lab setting, you've already been given ninety percent of the answer. And the first part of that is you've been told this is the question that needs to be asked. And you've been told, and there is a way that exists to get from this question to an answer that makes sense. Whereas most of what I do in my scientific research is trying to figure out what is the question that I need to be asking and how can I phrase that question so that there will actually be an answer once I've worked through the problem. And that answer will be interesting. Um, you want something, a question that if the answer is yes or no or whatever, that it's still going to be an interesting question that will teach you something about how the universe works. The second thing this painting reminds me of is, um, right, so this is illustrating parable of the way different, you know, you have people studying different things, doing different science, you have your ear scientists who are like fighting over, you know, the left ears versus the right ears are totally different, the people who are fighting over the trunk, you know, your scientist really just likes talking to the media and doesn't really do much of anything. Um, and what I really like about astronomy is that it's a very small field, and while it's possible to completely specialize in a specific topic, it's also very easy to draw different pieces of information from very different fields and synthesize them all into one big picture of how, for example, galaxies evolve from time. Um, and you don't have to be a specialist if you don't want to. And as someone who doesn't want to be a specialist, astronomy is a natural place for you to end up. Um, so astronomers are data. We can't do labs, right? We, we, we can't go out and, and, and you know, go um, set up you know, the exact initial conditions that we want. Um, but we're very, very good at counting photons. And so one of the ways that we synthesize different pieces of information to get a complete story is by using different wavelengths of light. So this is a spiral galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy, a very famous galaxy. Um, you might be used to seeing the visible wavelength light image from uh, Hubble. But if you look at it in an X-ray, that's tracing your very bright. Uh, you're very energetic, very hot gas. Uh, the ultraviolet traces recently star forming uh, uh, recent star forming regions, uh, very young stars. The visible wavelength light is affected by dust and it traces stars. Uh, the sun is a star. Uh, the near infrared light is still traces stars, but it's able to cut through all that dust. The mid infrared, you start seeing something very different. This is where the dust is now emitting light, um, and you're able to start tracking that directly. The radio continuum gives you something else different. Um, and then the, the H1 here just means neutral hydrogen uh, because there's no zero in Roman numerals. Um, and you can see here that the spiral arms of this galaxy, when you trace it in neutral hydrogen gas, are much more extended than what you would see if you were just looking at the stars alone. And then you can also see um, in carbon monoxide um, a similar thing. This is an emission line of, of um, uh, rotational J equals 1 to 0 state of CO um, that, that's also emitting and tracing. So the, this gas is the gas that's then going to continue to cool and collapse and form new stars. So the other uh, piece of the puzzle that I use in my work is um, uh, to try to figure out what's telling the whole story is the periodic table. So I'm guessing many of you teach this periodic table and their colors mean things. I think the yellow is metals. Um, yeah, this is the periodic table that I use on a daily basis. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that I got the correct reaction. 
Um, and it's even worse than this because helium is basically impossible to observe. Um, so we basically ignore it and we just assume that, that the amount of helium you have is just 1.3 or 1.4 times the amount of hydrogen you have by weight. If you're, or hy hydrogen plus helium is 1.3 or 1.4 times the amount of hydrogen you have. Um, and, you know, there's also a little bit of lithium, beryllium, and boron made in the Big Bang, but those are so completely negligible that we, there's just philosophical debates. Are those really metals or not? Um, and this is partially because if you look at cosmically, what is the cosmic abundance of the elements, this is what it looks like. You've got hydrogen, you have helium, and you probably can't even see from where you're sitting the little boxes labeled carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, neon, sulfur, iron, um, and then, you know, the smattering of other elements, right? Which is very different from the distribution that's in the world around us. Um, so in this room, we're in a very privileged location in the universe because we're, you know, in a super dense location where, where lots and lots of metals have, have collapsed and formed this planet. Um, and the reason I love metals is because if you show me a hydrogen atom, I don't know where that's been. I don't know what it's done. I don't know where it started. I, I can't tell you. But if you show me an oxygen atom, I know that that oxygen atom was born in the depth of a massive star. So I can tell you, much like putting duckies out into, you know, uh, uh, ocean currents, I can tell you something about how gas flows into and out of and around galaxies based on where the metals that form the stars wind up. Um, unfortunately, the Milky Way is actually really difficult to study in terms of uh, galaxy evolution because we're sitting inside of it. Right? Just like understanding Baltimore or understanding how buildings work is very difficult by sitting in this room right now. Um, I also really like this, this right here. But the, at its core, etymolo etym uh, from core etymology, um, the Milky Way is a galaxy. So we refer to the, the Milky Way galaxy as a galaxy with a capital G. Um, but if we're outside of our galaxy, it might look something like this. This is Andromeda, it's N30, also known as N31. It's our nearest uh, galaxy that's about our, our same size. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale here, um, this is M33. It's a galaxy that's considered very, very close to Andromeda. And you can just tell on the sky, this is a spike of just a bright Milky Way star, right? There's a lot of empty space in between these. Uh, to drive this point home a little bit more, here's Baltimore. Here's the sun, the solar system, where we're sitting right now. Uh, the smiley face is where Space Telescope is, by the way. We're at, um, we sit on the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus, even though we're not technically affiliated with them. Um, so, if this was the, so if this was the center of our Milky Way galaxy, and this was the solar system, the entire Milky Way would be about the size of the 695. So the distance from the Milky Way to Andromeda on this scale would be as far from here to Columbus, Ohio, where I went to graduate school. And there would be no other galaxies in this whole area that are of comparable size to either of our galaxies. Maybe some, there, there are a handful that are about one tenth the size, but, but nothing else that big. So, you know, that's a lot of empty space. And so the question that I ask a lot is, well, is it really empty? And the short answer is no, because how did these galaxies form in the first place? This is going to be the first kind of big random thing that I love that I can just pull out and combine with other ideas. And that is, um, you, this is a map from the, the Planck telescope of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and it was when uh, uh, the WMAP uh, telescope uh, put out a similar map of the cosmic microwave background in 2003 that for me personally, I was in college, and that was how I decided that out of all the physics, I wanted to go into astronomy because it was really exciting results. And the temperature, uh, the color coding here is, is different temperature of, of the gas. This is all about 2.7 Kelvin, um, but very, very, very small scale fluctuations. And these fluctuations, um, the, the redder regions are slightly higher density, and the, the bluer regions are slightly lower density, slightly colder. Um, and if you look at here, there's a very distinct scale of uh, the, these fluctuations. That's a whole other very interesting talk. For my purposes, this is basically the initial conditions of the universe, right? All that hydrogen and helium I was talking about that were the Big Bang were not initially distributed. They were, Regions that were slightly more dense and regions that were slightly less dense. So, if we just let gravity work for 14 billion years, uh, what ends up happening is 
is, and this is a movie from a, a simulation, this is um, a, megapar a megaparsec is a millionth parsec, so parsec is about three light years or so. Uh, uh, so this is a movie from a simulation, and what's showing here is the initial conditions um, are the denser regions have slightly more mass, therefore they have higher gravity, uh, so more material flows towards them, then they have more gravity, more material flows onto them, and so on. And so the dense nodes at the end of this movie are where the galaxies are forming. And that's the part that your eye is drawn to, but if you look outside of those filaments in these bluer regions, um, and actually the scale on this is very, very large, is not all of the material actually makes it into galaxies, and there's still hydrogen and helium left over outside of galaxies that is still, even 13.7 billion years later, slowly making its way into galaxies. Um, this is supposed to remind me to tell me something. Oh yeah, so the other piece that, okay, so we got, you know, very basic, big scale, you know, uh, particle physics on the large scale of the universe, that's like one, you know, piece in the toolbox. Uh, for how galaxies fall. The other piece is, well, what's going on inside of the galaxies, right? How, how do the stars actually form? Once you've got gas into the galaxies, how do the stars actually form? Completely different set of physics. And for these, I put a scale bar at the top just because I'm going to be changing a lot. So a kiloparsec is, um, I guess, about 3,000 light years. Um, so this is a galaxy. This is the Whirlpool galaxy again that's similar to the Milky Way. And the spiral arms that you see here, each of these bright red regions, as I mentioned earlier, is a region where lots and lots of stars are forming, where a bunch of gas has collapsed and is beginning to fragment into and form stars, and those stars are ionizing the gas around them. So if we zoom into one of those, it might look something like this. Uh, this is 30 Nebratus. It's a very large star-forming region in, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, uh, which if we were lucky enough to live in the Southern Hemisphere, we would see the night sky um, every night. Um, it's one of the, the neighbor galaxies of the Milky Way. Um, and I love this picture for so many reasons. One of them is all of this gas you can see, right? You can see, so these bright blue stars just formed out of this gas, and it pops out at you, right? These are very massive, very young stars. They're bright blue. That's why in these pictures, big pictures of galaxies, the young stars look blue because, well, they are. The colored gas, all of the colors here correspond to um, different... Um, ions, metals, that are emitting light. Um, so for example, the green down here is probably oxygen, because oxygen has some very strong um, ionic transitions, um, quantum transitions, uh, in, in what we typically call the, the G band, the green band of light. Um, so these stars are not going to live for very long. Um, in astronomy, it's great, because we can use the word instantaneous to mean 7 million years, or sorry, 10 million years. And so after 10 million years, all these stars are going to explode, um, which stars have been doing for a long time. Some of the one things that's great about astronomy is people have been looking at the night sky for a really long time. Um, so back in about 1,000 years ago, the Anasazi people saw this bright star um, in the sky, and I forget exactly, this is actually a really good map that, where they were able to figure out where in the sky this, this star was. Um, and it's hung out for weeks. You could see it in the daylight. It was brand new. Uh, the Chinese also saw it in document. The word supernova, right, corresponds to a really big new star, star in the sky. So you wait a thousand years, and what happened to that explosion? Well, it now looks like this. This is the Crab Nebula. And again, each of the colors in here corresponds to um, a different um, ion, uh, different ion transition. I think one of them is sulfur, one of them is nitrogen, and one of them is oxygen. Um, and the cool thing is, you look at the very center of this, and you can see, this is now an x-ray um, in the blue, um, the, the, the remnant of that supernova is now a neutron star that's spinning super fast, it's spinning out lots and lots of energy and momentum, and there's this amazing jet, it's just super cool. Um, so, as each of these stars explodes a supernova, they're going to be expelling lots and lots of freshly made metals into their surrounding interstellar medium. They're going to be putting out lots of um, energy, momentum. And actually, if you look at this, this is the second thing I really love about this picture. You look at this, you can see that these blue stars, these young, massive stars, are already carving out a bubble in the gas cloud they were born in. Um, and it's causing this gas to not be able to continue to cool and condense and fragment and form new stars. Um, and this bubble is, uh, this is just radiation pressure. 
So you've got so many photons coming out of uh, these stars at such uh, high energy that they're literally just pushing on this gas and they're able to blow out this bubble. Uh, this is a zoom in version of a ga galaxy. You can see these kind of horizontal regions of dust lanes, those are spiral arms. But if you look at, there are also these dust lanes coming up vertically from this galaxy, which if you zoom out, this is basically, there's so much star formation going on in this galaxy that it's completely blowing the gas and the dust out of the galaxy altogether. The poster child of this is M82, and I literally have posters over there for you to take, um, where this is now a galaxy that's viewed edge on, and these red regions, which unfortunately you can't see on here very well, these are cones, where the star formation that's going on at the center of this galaxy and the supernovae that are blowing up there are happening so much that they're blowing all of the freshly made material out of the galaxy altogether, uh, right? So this is about 10 kiloparsecs on the scale, right? These winds are about the same size as we can see. It's seen in dust. Um, it, uh, dust, if you think about it, right? It's mainly carbon, oxygen, maybe some other heavy elements, also being completely blown out of the galaxy. And it's also seen in, in x-rays and hot gas. There's an enormous amount of minimum and heat that's also going out with these winds and outflows. Um, which is all to say, yeah, these supernovae, you know, produce all of these um, heavy elements that you and I are all made out of, but a lot of it gets blown out of galaxies. And we can see this happening. And, but then what happens, right? Well, gravity is still around doing its thing. And so, and I'm not even going to try to toss this because I'll screw it up. Um, if you give something right a little bit of velocity, it comes back down. You all know this better than I do it probably. You give it a higher velocity, it spends more time in the air, comes back down. You give it enough velocity, it'll have an escape velocity, you might escape the galaxy um, and its dark metal, dark matter potential well altogether. Um, and the question is, we don't really know in which scenario, so which one of those happens? It's probably all of them. Um, we don't know if th this material that gets expelled from galaxies, does it hang out for a little bit? Does it hang out for a few billion years? Does it go out and never to return? We're not really sure, and we don't know which scenarios um, a, you know, what, what causes which one of those different scenarios to happen. And that's something that we're actively trying to figure out. Um, so how do we actually look at all of the material that's out here, right? I just told you all this material is leaving these, these galaxies, and there's remnants left over from the Big Bang, right? You can't see it on here. And that's because while there's a lot of stuff out there, space is really big. Uh, the typical density of this material is about one particle, atom, ion, whatever, per uh, cubic meter. Um, so, but space is really big, so if you have a really, really long path length, you can actually uh, be able to see it. And the way that we do this is, I like to think of it as, um, it's like trying to find fog, but if you have a really bright background light source, you can see the effect of the fog on that bright background light source. So my, background, my bright background light source is usually a quasar, um, and I point my favorite telescope at it, which is Hubble, of course, and then I can see how the light in the circumgalactic medium affects the background light source. Um, so to do this, um, I again have to start caring about um, what light I'm looking at. So uh, this, of course, is the electromagnetic spectrum that you all know and love, um, but this shows how far down to the atmosphere each wavelength of light is able to get. So for example, this hole here, where all that infrared light can't get to the ground, that's because we have a lot of water in our atmosphere, which is good, um, but it absorbs all that light. This is also why the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be so amazing, because we simply cannot do those experiments from the ground. But I want to talk to you about the ultraviolet, which really doesn't get to the ground, um, which all of us who get sunburns is very grateful for. Um, and it's basically because all of the main ionic transitions that, that all of the, this gas outside the galaxies have the real ones that are very strong, that actually tell us what's going on, are in the ultraviolet. So we have to go to space. Um, luckily, like I said, in about six years ago, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, or POS, was installed on Hubble. You can see I'm putting it in right there. It's about the size of a refrigerator. Um, and it's completely revolutionized everything we know about this field. And this movie is going to take quite a while to load. That's OK. Um, so this is going to show you a combination of uh, what I do for my functional work. Uh, so this is, you've got a big star field, everything looks the same. At some point, a little circle is going to show, going to pick out a, a back, bright background quasar. Quasar is also great because they emit a lot of ultraviolet light, 
which means that you could, they make a good background light source when you're trying to see something. Really. So this is the cost detector down here. So you have 2D uh, image up here, and then this is like a one-dimensional smushed version. It'll make more sense as more counts show up. Um, and so a large part of um, what we do is we, care, we have to care about the solid state physics of this detector in order to actually understand how do photons, how do the details of when the photons hit the detector, turn into electrons, actually get measured, what does that actually mean in terms of how many photons hit the detector to begin with, the actual flux of the, of the, the um, spectrum. On the top is what I do for my research life, um, which is I use um, hydrodynamic simulations that start with those initial conditions of the universe from the Big Bang, um, but include all the gas physics and let galaxies form in these simulated universes. And then I can make observations from those. Um, so the scale on here, you probably can't see it. This is 200 kiloparsecs on a side. And the color coding here is the, the gas density. So that green region and then the super red region in the very center, that's where the actual galaxy is. Um, and I'm shooting this mock sight line through it. And I'm looking at, uh, we call it silicon 2. This is just singly ionized silicon. It's a transition um, of silicon. And you can see when it hits this, um, you see absorption uh, corresponding to where that gap uh, is. Um, and you know, it's modulated between both the density of the gas and the actual line of sight velocity because you have Doppler shifting along the line of sight. So what I do for my research life is I try to figure out, well, if you observe something like this with cost, what does that actually tell you about the underlying metal content, kinematics, density, temperature of the gas? And then what does that information tell you about how gas is flowing into and out of galaxies. Um, so now that this is finished building up down here, uh, this is what a, a spectrum that we get off of the detector looks like. Um, and for my functional work, what I do is help um, actually calibrate this. So take into account the fact that down here the detector is a little bit sensitive and less sensitive than up here. Um, and so you can get a fully calibrated spectrum. And Oh, yeah. um, actually turn this into a science grade spectrum that we can actually look at and say, aha, you, you are hydrogen, and you, I know your atomic transitions, you are oxygen. Um, and uh, as it turns out, a lot of this, you, you go out and you say, well, I have a galaxy here, and I look at a sight line here, I see a lot of oxygen. And I repeat this experiment many times, right? I keep poking the, the circle black medium, seeing what I find. Um, and as it turns out, most of the metals, right, so there's a lot of empty space out here, um, but it turns out most of the metals that galaxies have ever produced are not in galaxies near the stars where they were formed, but they're actually outside of galaxies by far. About 80% of the, or more of the metals that galaxies have ever produced are outside of galaxies. And there have been hints about this for a long time because when you add up the amount of metals that you can see in the stars and in the gas between stars and in the dust that are in galaxies, it doesn't match how much you know those stars had to make. Um, and we've seen these winds coming out from galaxies, and so it's like, aha, they must be out there. But it's now with costs aboard HST just in the last six years, and we've actually been able to say, oh, we thought they were out here, they're out here, and this is what they're telling us about how galaxies are falling. So the last piece I'm just going to leave you with, which is kind of funny, as you may have seen this t-shirt before, the little cartoon of galaxy saying you are here. And what we're beginning to realize is the story is more complex than this. It's more complex than the we are star stuff, you were, you know, the stuff around us was born in the death of the star. Um, and the story is becoming that you were, at some point, out, you may have taken the, um, a trip to certain black space before the solar system formed. Uh, so I'm just going to leave you with my list of uh, resources uh, and take any questions.